this alien space it's scary with the news tune in on the radio don't let big brother know they're listening to everything even gary's late night show if you need a friend to talk to he will always be there the night show dreamers talk show will fix your despair because gary's talking to you at night Here now, the news, I'm Guy Ticker, NDTR News Director, Anchor, Reporter, Concierge, and Elevator Operator. Western U.S. residents report the most UFO sightings. What are they actually seeing? A new study suggests those of us in the Western U.S. who enjoy vast open spaces may also be more likely to report a UFO. An analysis of reports of unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP, suggests local environmental factors may play a role in the number of UAP sightings reported. The study from the National UFO Research Center is based on about 98,000 reports over 20 years and shows how reported UAP sightings coincide with environmental variables such as light pollution and cloud cover, as well as things like proximity to airports and military installations. The results reveal the majority of reported sightings originate in the western U.S., along with a smaller hotspot in the northeastern U.S. I'm Guy Ticker. The news is brought to you by Night Dreams Talk Radio Network. To submit a story or to get all the latest news, go to nightdreamstalkradio.com because the truth is out there. From best-selling author Paul Wallace, The Invasion of Eden, did our ancestors warn us about E.T. invasions and is history repeating itself in the 21st century? The standoff between the Pentagon and the U.S. Congress has exposed a dark web of secrecy surrounding UFO retrievals. The Invasion of Eden explores archaeological sites, biblical and ancestral narratives from around the world. Probing military intelligence, ancient indigenous knowledge, and sources close to prime ministers and presidents, Paul asks, what are the signs that our civilization may be on the cusp of a whole new world of E.T. contact? Laura Eisenhower says, The Invasion of Eden is a must-read book in these most critical times. Eric Von Daniken adds, Paul Wallace is a brilliant author. I have full respect for him. The Invasion of Eden, in paperback on Amazon, April 9th. You're listening to my friend Gary Anderson on My Dreams Talk Radio, the best in paranormal radio. Well, thank you, John. I just love your intro. Well, we got a great show here tonight. We're going to cover a lot of different things right after this, and then we're going to go down that rabbit hole here tonight. Deep in the Amazon jungle, one man. Hi, I'm Stan Gordon. Check out the Night Dreams Talk Radio with Gary the Big Dog. Yeah, yeah, let me finish. One man. Hi, I'm Mark Muncy. Check out Night Dreams Talk Radio with Gary the Big Guy. Yeah, do you mind? One man, naked and afraid. I'm losing my mind. Uh, you and me both, sister. One man, Gary the Big Guy. No boats, no lights, no motor cars, not a single luxury. Hey, any more and you'll have to pay a royalty. Okay, that's it. Hit it. From the summer vacation studios deep in the Amazon jungle, from that tree right there. See at the, the top, he's swinging. I'm losing my mind. Twice? All right. Coming to you live for now on Night Dreams Talk Radio Naked and Afraid, Gary the Big Guy Anderson. Well, we made it to Friday. Boy, the week has just gone by so fast. Well, in the news today, the Pentagon reports there's been more than 270 UFO sightings reported, well, at least to the Pentagon, in the last eight months, J.C., that is quite a few. That is quite a few. And just imagine, that's just tip the iceberg because a lot of people don't even report them. Well, I wonder why. <laughs> Think yeah. about it. You know, you know, years, it's totally changed. You know, going back in my first gun in broadcasting, when people would talk about 
UFOs. You know, people would step away from people like and kind of give them that look. Nowadays, people accept it. And you'd be surprised how many people believe that we are being visited. Now, I still feel, you know, again, like I've always said, humans have been warriors since day one. Cain and Abel, right? It has never stopped. Wars have never stopped on this planet. There's wars going around all over this planet. It has never stopped. Now, look how far we advanced from biblical times to now, and we still have wars. So, again, I, I just can't believe that a lot, if there is ETs out there, I can't believe every one of them is going to be, well, hey, I'm sending you an orb. You're my best friend. I, I really honestly feel that, you know, they had to start the same way we did, I hope. And, you know, I, again, we could be, be being visited by, well, the nice ETs and maybe the hostile ones. Well, that's just it. You, you really don't know. And common sense tells you there, this is a smorgasbord of a little bit of, of both. I mean, you just don't know. And that's that's the thing. How do you discern between these different types that are out there? You don't. Well, let's let everybody know who our guest is. So stay tuned. Here it is. Thomas Jane is an actor, director, and producer, working in Tinseltown for over 25 years. He's a triple Golden Globe nominee for the comedy series Hung, and has starred in such classic genre films as The Mist, Deep Blue Sea, and The Punisher. He directed and starred in the hit sci-fi series The Expanse. Jane won critical acclaim for his role as New York Yankee baseball legend Mickey Mantle in HBO's 61. His credits include Boogie Nights and Stephen King's 1922. Thomas Jane's production company, Renegade Entertainment, has been prolific since launching in late 2019. Thomas Jane recently completed his nonfiction book, A Human's Guide to Visiting Aliens, a combination of cutting edge scientific insight, exo speculation, and an incisive, unflinching review of the human condition makes a human's guide indispensable for ufologists, futurists, humanists, anyone with a keen interest in the human animal and where we may or may not be destined as individuals, as a society, and as a species. Thomas Jane's presentation at Contact in the Desert. When Worlds Collide. Humanity versus Visiting Aliens, A Collision of Worlds. The existence of visiting aliens completely transform our understanding of the universe, of consciousness, and of physics, of good and evil, of life itself. But we can only understand our visitors through the lens of our Western worldview. This set of rules, manners, customs, money, language, and myths that make up modern civilization. Defining the warp and curve of that lens is crucial if we're to grasp who visiting aliens really are and what they might want. By studying humans and their civilization, aliens could be playing the long game of discovering our vulnerabilities and gradually taking us down from within, with little to no destruction of our biosphere and our land. Alternatively, aliens could be here to help us navigate the treacherous road ahead, to elevate our species to a new level of consciousness and being. Or perhaps they're merely observers. These are, after all, interesting times. What we can learn about them may be limited. But what aliens have to teach us about ourselves may be revolutionary. The most powerful tool aliens may have to offer is not free energy or anti-gravity, but the ability to see our reality through the lens of an all-seeing alien eye. Well, Thomas, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing? Hey, that was great. Uh, that's... um the description for the talk I'm going to do at contact in the desert. And I got to tell you, he made it sound much cooler than, <laughs> than, uh, than I ever could. That was great. Oh, well, he's re that, that is my good friend, Eric. He does all our voiceover work and I've known him for years and I, yeah, I think he's a big part of the show. 
Very nicely done. And it's such a pleasure to be uh, sitting here talking to you. You know, you're a very busy actor. You have a production company and all that. How did you ever get time to write this great book? Oh, my God. Yeah. So uh, I feel like I'm kind of coming out of the UFO closet here, um, which I've got mixed feelings about. I'm a private person. I, I you know, I was antisocial as a kid. I wasn't socialized very well. Uh, we moved around a lot. Mom and dad were both in the army um, when I was, you know, a baby. And we um, uh, I didn't. I didn't uh, I didn't get socialized properly, which which I guess gives me a kind of an outsider perspective a little bit. And I think artists should have an outsider perspective on life. Um, this alien thing, I got I got to be honest, you know, I had an experience um, about 10, 12 years ago that I couldn't explain. And it sent me down a rabbit hole. Uh, and I and I, I landed on UFOs, alien visitation, uh, something I was interested in as a kid, but um, kind of forgot about it. You know, I was telling you earlier, you know, there was a great show when I was a kid called Project Blue Book, and they'd investigate was, you know, the Air Force investigating different uh, alien sightings, and they'd go around the country and and they always, at the end of the show, it was always a weather balloon uh, or it was an airplane. Um, so I kind of forgot about it. I think the indoctrination worked uh, for most people. We sort of drifted off and uh, really forgot all about that until I had this experience. So I guess you could say I lived as a normie for most of my life. And then 10 years ago, I had an experience I couldn't explain. And I started doing the research. And I... I wrote the book mostly for myself, you know, I was just trying to organize my thoughts and um, there was so much information um, and a lot and not too much about sort of what it all means, you know, for us as a society, um, for where we're headed, uh, for what for what our goals are, what our purpose is, you know, we we're we don't as a as a civilization seem to have a real overarching purpose you know it's very individual um get married have some kids all all great stuff everybody should have kids i've got one and it changed my life but um as a society we're we're just sort of this melting pot of this seething cauldron of different wants and needs and desires and and all that stuff and it made me wonder how do these guys survive? They can't survive doing this. You can't. This, what we're doing on this planet is unsustainable, period, full stop. I don't think we can make it to a, a civilization one. I really don't at this exactly, rate. Exactly. Exactly. Right. The Kardakov, Karta, whatever, that Russian guy, his, uh, his scale. You're right. Civilization one is a long way off, you know, and that's uh, just sort of the beginning. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've had some experiences in my life. You were talking earlier about um, driving through the desert in uh, what was it a GTO? It was a GTO, and it was it went fast. I can tell yeah. you that too fast. Yeah. And the desert's a perfect place to do that. The nice and straight. I've I've been there. I've I've t torn through the desert in my younger years, <laughs> doing stuff I shouldn't have. But you, uh, you, you had an experience, right? You saw this. Well, yeah, you know, like I was telling you, Thomas, it was really kind of eerie. You know, we were coming from North Carolina. I, I left a job there and, and I realized I didn't want to be married to my wife. And so we we're going to come back to Seattle and end our marriage. And, uh, here we are in the desert, you know, around one, two o'clock in the morning. And I'm doing, I'll be honest with you, probably a hundred and a hundred and five, whatever with, you know, the car easily would do. That's and, respectable. Yeah. And all of a sudden it lit up all around the car. It was so bright. I couldn't even look at the speedometer at that point. It lit up inside of the car and my wife was freaking out because we didn't, we only had enough money for gas to get back. 
And we were eating loaves of bread with nothing, just eating bread and drinking water to, to, through there. a couple of states. Uh, yeah. And so I pull over and I'm thinking, oh, God, I don't have no money for bail. I'm speeding. I'm going to go to jail. And who am I going to call to bail me out? And I get out of the car and I, I do the honorable thing. I stand by the car waiting for this helicopter to land. But the first thing I noticed, there was absolutely no sound. It was totally dead, just nothing. And the light was there for maybe like about 20, 30 seconds and poof, it was gone. Right. And it was the most eerie feeling I ever had. Yeah. And you tell that story to people who sort of aren't familiar with this subject. And that just sounds like a really weird uh, experience. But, but the truth is like, that's so common. The, the, the bright light and the silence um, is, uh, you know, the desert is also a hot spot for getting picked up by, by a UFO. I, uh, so you told that story and it brought back a memory that I haven't thought about in a long time. Driving in a similar, uh, but upstate New York where my grandparents lived and my grandfather and my father, big fishermen, I fish, but not like these guys uh obsessive trout you know um and uh um, fly fishing my grandfather used to chase uh our cats when he'd come and visit my mom always had three four cats and my grandfather chase them around with a pair of scissors snip their tails and grab (laughs) some of that fur and and he'd be tying his own flies i actually have uh a framed uh bunch of his flies that are that are framed on the wall here so we're driving. It's nighttime. It, we're driving back from a fishing trip in upstate New York. My grandfather is driving. My father is in the passenger seat and I'm in the back and I'm probably seven or eight years old. And my dad, my grandfather had one of those cars with the sunroof. So you could see, and I was looking up, it was night sky, brilliant out in the country, see all the stars. And there was a fireball. Um, That's a good way to describe it, a fireball. And as it was moving around, it was kind of circling around or doing these sort of figure eights way up there. And you could see the little tail of the fireball up there. And I remember as a kid thinking, what the hell is that? And so I asked my dad, I go, dad, dad, look, you see that? My dad doesn't answer. He just stares and, you know, they're driving. Maybe they had the radio on. I can't remember, but... He's just staring off into space. I go, Grand, Grandpa, Bapa, that was his name. Bapa, Bapa. He, him too. He just stared. Both of them like zombies, just driving. That's my memory. Now, it's so long ago that I can't. It goes into that fuzzy space where, and it's also unusual. So I can't, I can't nail it down as a real memory, or is that, or was that a dream? You know. Anomalous experiences have a way of drifting off into sort of a, a gray basket, what Stanton Friedman would call the gray basket, where it's neither here nor there. You can't put it in real reality that you know and love, and you can't quite put it into imagination, dream. It lives in this other world, you know? And that's true also of the experience that I had about 10 or 12 years ago. I, I know it was real. <laughs> I know it was real, my experience, but when I think about it, it's drifted into this strange sort of back closet of my life, you know, where it doesn't fit with the other experiences of my life. So it's separated somehow. Well, Thomas, you had this other encounter about 10 years ago. I mean, uh, what happened to you? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not ready to talk about that. It's enough for me that I'm sitting here saying, hey, I'm an actor, I live in Hollywood, and, and I've written a book about UFOs and aliens. I mean, it just, it's just in one way seems so typical. Um, but I really took, take it seriously, you know. And, and a lot of people have had experiences. I mean, Jesus, when you start looking into this, it's endless the history of encounters with UFOs, with humanoid beings, with diaphanous sort of, uh, you can't tell if they're interdimensional. I mean, 
but these experiences all, all exist. And the fact that they've changed someone's life, the fact that they're brave enough to report it and make a record of it um, is a is is enough to say okay you know um, maybe there's something going on here maybe there's something worth looking at it's very difficult to get our society to turn their heads first of all we don't have time you know everybody's got, uh, got bills to pay they got kids to raise they've they've their life is full most of us and we don't really have time for these sort of like other little baskets of hobbies you know if it becomes a hobby you start making time like my grandfather tying ties right wasn't part of his life but he sure did enjoy doing it and geez it's one of the only things i've got left from him so all that to say the uh, the experience itself isn't as important and i will um Probably, I will write it down at one point, or I actually have written it down, and maybe I'll share that at one point. Um, you know, but I'm not quite ready to do that. You know, it, it's really hard to, to, you know, to share your experience. It took me many years, over 48 years for me to come and ex tell people what I had That's happened right. to me because I didn't want people to label me. As, you know, as strange, you know, right. especially in, you know, the broadcasting industry. And so I kept quiet about it. But, you know, you know, when I talked to Stephen Davenport back about four years ago, he had an encounter uh, about the same thing, the bright light, the whole everything. And, and he runs the UFO reporting center, by the way. And again, I've talked to right, other people. Right, right, right. That's right. Yeah. I've talked to other people who've had these type of experiences. And, and honestly, I'll be honest with you. I used to think before I had my experience, anybody talked about this was crazy. And then I had my experience, but then I, like you, I put it on the back burner. I forgot about it to, I went to a surgeon that, you know, cause something was going wrong. We had to have surgery done and MRI and x-rays and something appeared in up in my neck of one of the vertebrae, uh, a metallic thing. And it freaked me out and it still freaks me out because I can't go through anything, uh, without setting an alarm off. You know, <laughs> it's, it's scary. Yeah. You're on the list. The, uh, <laughs> at the airport. Well, that's yeah. Well, that's, when they take you in that, and that's not just it, even the courthouse, they did that. You, could you imagine one of, like I mentioned, one of my sons got in trouble and I had to go to drug court every month. And you go into the courthouse, right? And you have to remove your pants. Uh, not your pants, but your belt. <laughs> well, I did remove my pants. I'll well, tell you that real you quick. You, you have to remove, you know, any, all your change. If you have a metal belt buckle, you have to take your belt off. Right. And I was wearing kind of loose pant jeans. And they said, okay, put your hands above your head. And they took the wand. And then I realized my pants were down to my knees and there was about a hundred people you know all in the the lobby of the courthouse and i'll tell you that was the most embarrassing thing in my life <laughs> and they've and you've lived with this uh they can't take it out they can't take it out because you know it would do permanent damage sure right right so it's sort of you know probably and you don't have any memory of any kind of shrapnel or anything that might have lodged itself in there no not at all and that's what the surgeon uh dr moran was really shocked because he was looking for you know a scar tissue because he said it has to be scar and it was absolutely no scar tissue uh mm -hmm. tissue so that's so common in the, um, you know, in the abduction. I mean, my next question would be, did you experience any missing time when this uh, bright light in the desert uh, happened? Well, you know, again, when something like this happens, how do you know you have missing time unless you're sitting in your car's locked and you're outside the car? I mean, I, you know, it, something weird happens. I mean, I, if you have missing time, how do you know you have missing time? Usually so, someone will, you know, when you're driving through the desert, you don't really have a, a specific ETA, but usually you'll be like, I, sh I know I should have been home by 10 p.m. And I got when I pulled up, it was 1 a.m. You know, that that's how you're like, wait a second. How the hell? What is this thing broken? And it, that sends you down sort of it. But it's it. it it's tricky, you know, I mean, I think that's part of the reason why these, these, uh, 
visitors um, do what they do. You know, they sort of fold the pot, the experience into a, a, a different part of the brain. Some people consciously recall these experiences. It could be weeks or it could be years later. Other people never um, remember anything. Some people have had some help with hypnosis and stuff, but I think the vast majority of people who have these alien encounters don't don't remember them and don't have anything. You know, they'll have a strange events in their life. But other than that, they don't have any real memories of, of being on a craft or having like somebody uh, a, somehow that little uh, chip in, uh, next to your spinal cord. Somehow that got in there. You know, you weren't born with it. No. And, you know, here's the other thing, Thomas, the people who go and get regressed and if they don't go to a certified hypnotist right? and they go to somebody else, let's face it, how many Star Wars, Star Trek, how many sci-fi alien movies has there been? Right. And, and if you go to somebody who's not certified, how do you know that all of a sudden they say, oh, you were abducted by these aliens and, you know, all this stuff after you've been, you know, regressed. It's How, a conundrum. It for could sure. be what's all in your mind of watching on TV too, for and in the theater. There's a conflicting uh, ideas about the efficacy of hypnotism, right? Um, obviously, it has beneficial effects and can really help people who are suffering from PTSD. Uh, and there's a there's a number of beneficial uh, effects that have been reported with hypnosis. There's also what they call confabulation, where you, you feel. But as to how susceptible a person really is to sort of absorbing a suggestion of a story, you know, eh, I have trouble thinking that if I have had no alien experiences and I go to a hypnotist and he somehow suggests that I did, uh, I just don't see how that would work. You know, I don't see how I'd go, yeah, I'll, you know, and then uh, the confabulation of, so they did studies. They were like, well, maybe these people are just super suggestible with big, serious imaginations. You know, they're imaginative. They're, they, I think it's called fantasy prone. But we've not found that abductees are any more fantasy prone than the rest of the uh, population. So hypnosis, controversial, but it's not the only, uh, you know, uh, mode of evidence that we have. We've had plenty of people that have recalled experiences without the use of hypnosis. So it doesn't answer the question um, is in a satisfactory way you know have you ever thought about it i on? have and we have to take a break for the stations so thomas we're going to be back in three minutes and we'll continue on great. i think it's going to be a great show here for so you know guys put your feet up on that easy chair put a log in that fire pour yourself something warm to drink because it's going to be really hot here so stay tuned you're listening to night dreams talk radio check out our website at www.nightdreamstalkradio.com We'll be right back after this. Hello, flabby American. Would you like to be muscles? Would you like to be so healthy you could sit on public toilet without girly paper? Would you like to live to 150, 170 years old? Oh, my, yes. Then come to the Wee Flea Some You Gym. Formerly Dr. McCoy's, he's dead gym. At the Wee Flea Some You Gym, we specialize in dumbbells. I mean, weightlifting. Ow. Oh, feels good. Yeah. Oh, don't worry, that'll grow back. At the Wee Flea Some You Gym, we we absolutely, totally, 100% guarantee. Not an actual guarantee. You'll be an Olympic athlete in 10, 15 minutes tops. So come, flabby girly man, to the We Flee Some You Gym. Tell him, Ivan. Hello, this month at We Flee Some You Gym, free bag of steroid vitamins make you very healthy, very strong, very muscle. Don't tell cops. So, what are you waiting for, flabby man? Come to the We Flee Some You Gym now, endorsed wholeheartedly by Johnny Weissmuller. He's dead. By Jack LaLanne. He's dead. Never mind. We play some new gym. Your membership will never end until your credit card gets declined.
This just in to the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network Newsroom. I'm Guy Ticker, news director, anchor, reporter, and aerial acrobat. Supermassive black hole is doing what? Like a monstrous cosmic spider, a distant supermassive black hole is spinning a jet of plasma into a twisted rope and blasting it out at near light speed. Astronomers witnessed this spectacular sight with a network of radio telescopes, including the Radio Astron Space Telescope, that are combined to form an Earth-sized antenna. Specifically, this network was trained to observe the heart of a distant blazer named 3C279. These observations comprise the most detailed look scientists have ever had at an astrophysical jet emerging from a supermassive black hole, revealing a complex twisted pattern near the jet's source. This new picture could challenge currently accepted theories that for 40 years have been used to explain how these jets are created and how they evolve over time. I'm Guy Ticker. The news is brought to you by Night Dreams Talk Radio Network. To submit a story or to get all the latest news, go to NightDreamsTalkRadio.com because the truth is out there. You are listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio Network, the home of Night Dreams Talk Radio with Gary Anderson, syndicated worldwide. Paranormal Talk Radio, like you remember. And Thomas, we are back. This is great. Perfect timing. I had a nice uh, cup of tea. Okay. That's good for you, too. You know, <laughs> I, I got to quit drinking soda and gaining a lot of weight. But going back to, you know, a lot of people, here's the thing. I don't know if these, these aliens or ETs or my Aunt Bertha are friendly <laughs> or full. Because if you look at it, there's a lot of people that vanish. And, you know, according to the FBI website, they do find about 90% of the people that go missing one way or the other, but there's still about 10% out of thousands of people that vanish with no trace. Which seems like a lot, 10%, you know, it, it, with today's sort of our modern technology, it seems like you'd be able to find a lot more than that, you know, 10%, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a mystery. 411, missing 411. Great stuff. Well, maybe they're being, you know, abducted. You remember the old Twilight Zone series, The Serve Man? Oh, one of the best. Yeah. It's a cookbook. <laughs> but you never know. Here, here's the point, you know, again, a lot of people think, well, gee, you know, they would never allow a nuclear war. They would never allow this. They would never allow that. They're here to help mankind. But I'll be honest with you, Thomas, we had COVID. We have had war after war. We had, you know, Hitler, you know, exterminating, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people. And that went on in other countries, like in Russia even. And nobody stopped it. Oh, right. You're saying, you know, the aliens want to intervene, right? Yeah, well, yeah. I and then if they were good... Would they help us? You know, we've got some serious problems. We've got an energy crisis. We've got cancer rampant. We've we've got um, uh, pollution. You know, that's uh, killing a lot of people. I just found this out in New Delhi, India. Two million people die from pollution every year. Every year, the inhalation. I mean, it's the, one of the dirtiest cities on the planet. Um, this in a world right so you say well what kind of world are we living in you know um <laughs> at least i do i mean so we've got we're on the verge of this kind of a new ai technology right that's the fruit of an incredible big tech infrastructure um and and that based in san francisco is living on top of one of the worst homeless problems that our country's ever seen right at the same time on this planet right now, we have hunter gatherers um, in the rainforests of Brazil and elsewhere. In Africa, millions, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's 30 million nomads. This, we're talking nomadic tribes, people without a country uh, are living in Africa. 
Then you go to Las Vegas and we've built this sphere. <laughs> it's about as high tech a thing as anybody's ever seen. You know, you too just played in this in, in, in incredible place, but living also in Las Vegas under the tunnels, living under the city is another homeless population. Thousands of people living in the tunnels below the sphere, right? Now that's dangerous too, because they get flash floods. Oh yeah, no, no, they 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 get flooded and they die down there. From time to time, they open those um, gates and the, all those tunnels are flooded and wash all those guys out. They're lucky if they make it out alive. So that's our world. It's too complex to quantify, right? Somebody said, I wish I could remember who. They said we are we have a prehistoric biology living in a medieval system with futuristic technology. <laughs> and that's kind of who who we are, you know? And then my talk is called When Worlds Collide, right? So that that's one world, that's our world. It's sort of the world that it's way too big for any of us to wrap our, our minds around, but you, you know what I mean. And then there's the elites, the world of government and corporate control who own everything who uh, who make the rules, who control the military, uh, they control the energy, they control the flow of money around the world. These people live in a different world than, than most of us. Richard Dolan uh, coined the phrase a breakaway civilization to, to describe partly the, you know, that, that world that um, exists you know, in, in a world that none of us are, are you know, uh, really know what the hell is going on. And third, the third world is them, the aliens. You don't know where they come from. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they want, but we know they're here. Look, we know they're here. Uh, there's some debate in the, you know, in which is amazing, by the way, the, the press, you know, since 2017, we've seen this resurgence, which is really born out of the Internet, the information age. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, I, I, I'm interested in this intersection between these three worlds. Um, that's why I've been, you know, write, writing the book. And I think that the UFO topic is heating up. I think that major upheavals for the human race are looming, and they're looming in the not too distant future. So I think now is the perfect time for you know folks to uh, start s speaking up, start looking into it, start taking it seriously. Go to the conferences, you know, get get find out what these researchers are thinking. What they're um, and as we grow this, I think, I believe that this question, the alien question, the UFO question will only grow in relevance, uh, to the survival of our species. You know, I think the alien question is the question for our time and for all time to come, you know, if we want to survive. Well, that, you know, you said it so beautifully because if you really think about this you know going back to roswell i've had so many people say oh roswell doesn't count that was 77 years 70 some years ago and here's the thing you know congress had their disclosure you know uh, and i'll be honest with you i was so disappointed i told a lot of people you're not going to find out anything new uh, yeah, that was the Arrow uh, report. At least that's the, the recent one, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was just it just happened March 9th. Um, you know, they they said the same damn thing that Project Blue Book was saying in 1969. Most sightings are misidentification of ordinary objects, right? Well, uh, something is going on. We got cattle mutilation that happens off and on. Uh, we have human mutilation that's been reported, and I've seen pictures of it. Uh, something is going on out here, but the thing is, maybe they still... It, it, look at this. When I was a kid, I, I stole some money out of my mom's purse. So the ice cream uh, guy was going by. 
And I wanted an ice cream. She said no. So when she was doing the dishes, I went and grabbed a quarter, bought five ice cream bars, ate them all, came back. My mom said, what, you, you stole some money. And I go, no. Yes, you did. Here's the problem. The government, one way or another, has been lying to the population. And to come clean, how do you, if you lied for 70 some plus years, how do you come clean? Because if you come clean, then nobody's going to believe the government at all. The only way to do it is to give the people who are keeping the secrets immunity, some kind of immunity, you know, sort of like the truth and reconciliation uh, that happened in uh, South Africa. We go, okay, let's just put our cards on the table here. The past is the past. Now, let's talk about what's going on. It's the only way to to do it, you know. But the problem that you're bringing up is a very real one because if they're lying and have been lying, and they have, about UFOs for the last 77, 80 years, what else have they lied about, you know? And Richard Dolan talks about this, okay? So, okay, so tell us again, who killed JFK, you know? Yeah. What, what happened to Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> Why don't you tell us the story of 9-11? How about we start there, you know? It, it just opens up this chasm <laughs> that uh, is really difficult to deal with, you know? And it does, it, it is. And you know what? They've, they've earned it. We, we don't trust the, the government. It's an all-time low right now. The information, I think it's because of the information age. We've but, got so much information, and these guys are trying to put that genie back in the bottle, uh, and they're trying to do it through a kind of totalitarian, you know, version of taking away our free speech and all these other crap that's happening uh, in the world. They're re we're, we, which is why I say, you know, we're headed for trouble. I mean, we're, there's a looming crisis ahead. Um, Unfortunately, you know, I had Professor Starr on, who's the expert on nuclear war. And he even said, we're very close to a nuclear war. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, then that's, and then he even explained what would happen. And let's face it, if a, if a nuclear war exchange had, we're all gone. Yes. Yeah. I mean, even just the nuclear winter and all that wonderful stuff. I mean, you're looking at basically anyone who does survive is going to starve to death. You know, because of the uh, all the crops are going to die. Yeah, it's hard to believe. It's hard to wrap your mind around that we could really do that. And should aliens who obviously have the technology intervene in something like that? OK, I understand, you know, we're down here in the seething cauldron of humanity. They're, you know, they're not, they're not gonna, you know, they're not, not, not gonna stop you from stealing 25 cents out of your mom's purse, right? You know? But how, is there a limit? <laughs> and I think there might be. If you look at planet Earth, it's a jewel, right? In, in uh, as far as as far as we most people know, this might be the only jewel uh, like it in uh, in the universe. And that might be true in a way we this, you know, just like every person is unique. This may be a unique planet and have unique qualities that no other planet has. I'm perfectly willing to believe that. But I what I and I also believe that the universe is teeming with life, teeming. Um, I think it's way more abundant than even our uh, wildest imaginations about how how populated the universe might be. So if it's that if it's that prevalent then you could say well what's one planet more or less you know if they blow each other up and you know life sort of you know some of it will survive you know maybe five percent maybe ten percent and give it a few thousand years and uh, you know and <laughs> it'll all sort of build up again well that's one way to look at it well, it's a possibility. Way, it, you know, it, would they intervene? Would they stop something like that? I don't think I wouldn't want to bet on it. Yeah, you wouldn't want to bet on it. No, I mean, you know, that's the scary part. But, you know, again, you got people who are naive, honestly, Thomas. I had so many people on. Well, you know, we're the only life. There is no life out there other than this planet. You've and had I, people on say that? Oh, yes. And, you know, when, when they talk that way, I look at them. Wow. 
you are so naive to have those ideas that we're the only intelligent. We might be no smarter than an ant. Well, look, it was a it was a um, legitimate um, hypothesis before uh, we learned about UFOs and aliens. And now it's just becoming like it's just they're just embarrassing themselves. You know, the, these days, you know, what's the, the science guy? Tyson, you know, yeah. what I'm talking about the black guy. Yeah. Um, gosh, this guy, he's doubling down. Like he really, he's, he's talk about a gatekeeper. Um, and you know what? That might serve a purpose because some people are not ready to open that door, you know, and they're just not willing to go there. However, you know, it, you're right. It's, it's naive and that can be dangerous. It yeah. is. You know, back years ago, my, my father was a, a cl very close friend of James Gardner, the, you know, the Rockford Files and all that stuff. I loved him. Oh, yeah. Oh. And he was such a sweet guy because I, God, I, when I was a little kid, I didn't know who he was. And one day he was at our house visiting my dad and I go, oh my God, you're the guy who played Maverick. Yeah. But he, he, here's the thing. He connected me uh, to Ronald Reagan when Ronald Reagan was president. And I, I, I talked to Ronald Reagan a couple times when he was in the White House. And one of the things I was really worried, the newspapers are playing up the, like a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And it was just always, you know, uh, that Cold the Cold War, war. It was Huge. horrible. Huge. And, and Star Wars, they were trying to get the funding for Star Wars. SDI. And I asked Ronald Reagan, and I said, will it protect us against them out there? Or I asked him, would it protect us against the Soviet Union? And then what he turned around and said to me, it'll protect us against them out there. And then wow. he very quickly corrected his story. And ah. then he went to about the Soviet Union. But when he said out there was not like over there. Right. And, and then a week later, he goes up to the United Nations. He gives his speech. And That's then, right. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, you know what? Star Wars, maybe not been designed really for you know protecting us against the soviet union maybe it's something else going on yeah yeah he would he said that on several occasions where he would basically say look what if we were there was an outside threat you know that uh, would we band together as a world and unite to to you know fight this outside threat and isn't it a shame that you know, uh, we can't do that now. You know, he, he, he said that a few times. And I always thought, this guy, this guy. But, you know, he had a UFO sighting. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something that I'm, that I'm not supposed to say. But there's a good chance that I'm going to play Ronald Reagan. In, uh, there was a weekend that happened in, in the 80s where... They, he got together with Gorbachev, you know, and they sort of wanted to hash out sort of the future of the planet and what we're going to do about all this, these nuclear weapons. And it's really a historic uh, meeting. So someone's written a script about that. They have the transcripts from those uh, from that weekend, those meetings that they had. Fascinating stuff. So I've actually just been reading all about Ronald Reagan. Yeah, he was really interesting. Like I said, I only talked to him a a few times, but I mean, he was really an open and warm person. He almost, he also told me about that beach craft, him and his wife. And I can't remember who the, uh, one of his other people was yeah, governor or something. I can't remember either. Yeah. They, they were looking out at the beach craft and there was a UFO. That's right. And didn't Reagan say, Hey, fo follow that, that UFO. Didn't he, didn't he tell the pilot to go around and investigate yeah, I, that? I not, I don't remember that, but I, I think I, I remember that. And uh, of course, Carter, he saw a UFO. Shit, he, he ran that as part of his campaign. If That's, I'm president, I'll release those files. They have all said that. You know who else said that? You know, the Clinton said the same thing when he was running for a president. He was going, in fact, he even said it on the Tonight Show. He said he was going, or Letterman Show, I can't remember which one, that they were going to release you know, if he became president about what's going on about this. But every president, you know, says and makes these promises. It never comes out. Yeah. 
There's a great story about Carter. Do you, do you know after? So he really, he was serious because obviously he had his sighting. And uh, people were really excited about that. And apparently, you know, he never did. And the story is that um, they had they had a meeting, nobody know, a closed door meeting, but uh, after that about UFOs and about you know trying to get these files out there. And after the meeting, he was seen at his desk crying, with his head hung low, crying. He was the president of the United States sitting at his desk crying. And uh, of course, the question is, what did they tell him? You know, what was that about? And if, and he never did uh, talk about releasing those files again. And you have to wonder, what did they tell him? What do they know that we don't know? You know, and my instinct is not a lot. And I, I think that in the end, in the final analysis, I'm sure they've got a lot of facts and a lot of details. But in the final analysis, they're not they're They're almost just as in the dark as we are. I'm talking about the military and the, um, you know, the the uh, secret groups that study this stuff. You know, what do you think about AI? You know, again, you know, I was watching a movie a couple of weeks ago. I was into it for 10 minutes and I realized those aren't real actors. <laughs> and it dawned because I started noticing, you know, the contrast was kind of weird off and on. It was AI generated, you know, um, indie movie and i i'm going wow is this what it's coming about i mean you it's know, getting spooky yeah but maybe they you know there's been talk for years about a false flag mm. and as ai keeps advancing could you imagine if the government wanted to pull something they could pull it trying to figure out how to watermark ai it's a big it's a big concern you know what is there anything we can do to sort of put a stamp on this stuff so that we can tell the difference because it's getting to be at the point where you can't tell the difference. You know, you see a lot of the UFO photographs these days and boy, some of them just look really good, you know, and the, uh, but you can't, you just can't put any stock in any of these photos or videos these days. Well, it, it, I, it's scary. I'll be honest with you, Thomas. Up in here in Seattle, there was a, a court case going on where there was a, a person got killed in Des Moines, Washington, and it was ca uh, caught by a, uh, you know, a surveillance camera, but it was kind of blurry. So this guy who was an avid videographer decided to clean it up with AI. And then the defense attorney wanted to use it. The, the judge looked at it and goes, well, I'm not going to accept it because it's AI. It's, you know, how do we know it's actually, you know, what it is, but it's going to even come down very shortly. One of these judges is going to accept something like that. Mm. And that is going to be scary because then, you know, a lot of people could be going to prison for something they never done. Yeah. And as this sort of totalitarian, uh, streak works itself out in the in the west we're, we're going to see we're going to see the weaponization of just about everything that uh, that can be i saw a talk by ray kurzweil the futurist um fantastic and he his his uh, point of view on ai was that it's going to completely change everything not only in the digital sphere but 3d printing 3D printing is going to sort of come into its own in the next 10 years where we have the materials and I think most households that can afford it and it'll get cheaper over time will have their own little AI uh, 3D printer. Um, so, you know, they'll also be able to use um, three, 3D printers to construct office buildings in a modular fashion. Yeah. Um, the physical products, which we normally don't think of as information technology, are going to come online and and create, according to Ray, uh, a new kind of abundance that we're experiencing in the digital world now. You know, I mean, the digital world is exploding. That's going to bl start bleeding over into the physical world. Food production will become a product of information technology. You know, right, right now uh, it's horizontal, right? It's flat. We, you know, it takes up a huge amount of our land. Um, he says we're going to switch to vertical 
hydroponic agriculture, uh, growing with no chemicals, but all this will be adjusted, uh, you know, fed with with AI information technology. Um, Supercomputing is going to come up with new materials. There's a um, what's it called, uh, a uh, information, what do they call it? Like a library, but for materials, right? They call it Moogle. Yeah. <laughs> Where you can look up any kind of material, and that, but AI is going to start putting these materials together in ways that we could never think of. Um, you know, so by the 2030s, we're going to start miniaturizing, everything. We're going to have the ability to build machines at the molecular level. Right now, we're kind of getting good at at, uh, at molecular, but with AI and the 3D printing and Moogle, we're going to start be able to build at the atomic level. We're going to start rearranging atoms, building nano robots the size of blood cells, Right, the program to attack cancer, viruses, uh, you know, um, metabolic diseases like diabetes. Well, uh, you know, I'm going to jump in. I know a, a, a physician real well, and we talked about AI. You know, right now, insurance companies use that. So when they look at somebody's, you know, medical record, the, the AI does and makes a decision if that person is el- going to be eligible for surgery or this and, and or for medication and right. and and that's scary too because you know it, it's taking the human element out of it and you got it now artificial intelligence making a decision if you can have that operation or not or you're going to die or live right but that doctor went to school and he did his eight years or you know however many years he, he took and hopefully if he's any good he's still studying trying to keep up reading the journals but that guy has one life with two eyes and one brain right and there's only so much information that he can take in and then he's got to rely on his own reason to make those decisions whether or not you're going to go into surgery or what's really wrong with you ai will have access to all of the information, all the journals, all the whole, the history, everything that everyone's ever learned will be available to AI. So, I mean, I might try trust an AI doctor more than I would trust a, a human. I don't trust doctors much anyway. Yeah. And I think it's still incredibly primitive, you know. It is. You know, Thomas, our time is up. And I, I, again, I want to let the people know where you're going to be uh, very shortly, Contact in the Desert. Contact in the Desert, I th- it's up in northern, uh, no, mid-California. I think it's where, um, oh boy, what's that, uh, what's that great um, uh, co- uh, festival that they have up there in Kingston? I can't remember it. I'm not obviously not a festival goer. But it's up there in the desert contact in the desert um, dot com and it's may 31st uh i think through june 2nd and geez i think they've got like 60 speakers they've got every everybody come for some reason people really dig this conference i think it's because it has sort of a an a, a, a relaxed loose atmosphere where the researchers all kind of mingle with the guests and you know i i, I think from what I understand, um, it's a party under the stars at night. So, um, you know, I've never been. I've always wanted to go. This is the 10th anniversary. Um, so I think it's it's going to be a special event. Uh, I'm really excited about it. And you're going to be speaking. Jeez, you know. Yeah, I'm going to have to write something because I'm not good at sort of off the cuff. Uh, I've, I've, or maybe, or I think I'm going to have to start rehearsing. I'm like, I'm an, actor. I'm an actor. How the hell am I going to stand up there and talk about all that? But I've certainly got enough of it in my head. <laughs> so it promises to be really fun, really good time. And I'm very excited to do my to do my talk and and um, and really to meet those researchers that I've been sort of studying. I, I've never really met, uh, you know, a lot of them. Um, Steve Bassett. Who does the disclosure project? Right. I'm friends with him, and Paul Heineck, uh, who's Jay Allen Heineck's uh, son. Yeah. He's a great guy. Yeah, they they they. Uh, well, Bass has been on my show many times, 
That's what's great. Yeah. We just had dinner the other night, yeah. um, you know, t- talking about, he said, you know, he's a one trick pony, disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. <laughs> well, someday we might get it. Well, Thomas, I want to thank you so much. And you know, my favorite uh, movie you've done, by the way, the deep blue sea and fog and what fog. Oh, oh, the mist. Yeah. The mist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, uh, those were good times. Um, I still have a little rash on my face from deep blue sea. Uh, <laughs> we were shooting at those tanks down there in uh, Mexico where they, they built them for the Titanic. Uh, and they were so big that they couldn't filter the water properly. So now I've got to put cortisone on my, even to this day, it's, it's a little gift from deep blue sea. Well, you're going to re- probably remember that to the day you die. <laughs> well, this is great, Gary. I really, uh, really enjoyed it, man. I, I really enjoyed having you on, my friend. And you have a great weekend, will you? Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. you take care and thank you for coming on. Thank you. Okay, Bye-bye. my friend. Well, JC, who's our next guest and what are we going to be talking about? Well, our next guest is Andrew Bashago, the time-traveling lawyer. And we're going to be talking about how he got selected for his time travel projects as a young man. It's going to be really interesting. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. I'm going to play a little music and we're going to get him on and come back for another half an hour of night dreams. Talk radio. Latest news from the Night Dreams Talk Radio Network newsroom. I'm Guy Ticker. How much does Earth weigh? Scientists have spent centuries determining Earth's mass, which is its resistance to movement against an applied force. According to NASA, Earth's mass is 5.9722 times 1,024 kilograms, or around 13.1 septillion pounds. That's quite a bit. It equates to around 13 quadrillion of Egypt's Pyramid Khafre, which itself weighs around 10 billion pounds, 4.8 billion kilograms. The Earth's mass fluctuates slightly due to the addition of space dust and gases leaking out of our atmosphere. But these tiny changes won't affect Earth for billions of years. So don't worry. I'm Guy Ticker. The news is brought to you by Night Dreams Talk Radio Network. To submit a story or to get all the latest news, go to nightdreamstalkradio.com. The truth is out there. Do you remember how great paranormal talk radio was in the 80s and 90s? Night Dreams Talk Radio brings back to you talk radio like you remember with your host, Gary Anderson, broadcasting to you live from his secret compound deep in the great Northwest. Now, here's Gary. And here I am, JC. That was really an interesting guest. Thomas was really a fantastic guest. 
He was. I, I boy, I'm so thankful we he came on and uh, yes, uh, it was. I loved it. Loved the show. Yeah, you know, he first wasn't going to come on camera, and then somehow you managed to talk him into it. And I want to thank you. You are you are so welcome. I'm thrilled we had him on, and uh, I, I don't see him on a lot of other shows, so I think that's a first. I love it. And we, you know, again we had a good conversation. Yes. So, you know, that what makes it interesting for all of you. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do. And uh, also check out our website at www.nightdreamstockradio.com. We have all the latest news stories, everything from UFOs to cryptics to Taiwan, what's going on. Like they wanted to give a Africa wanted to give a whole bunch of elephants to another country to settle their debt. That's like that's going to happen. And it's all there, literally hundreds of news stories that you would spend days looking for. Well, my newsman, Guy Tickers, does it all for you. Well, who do we have next? Next, we have Andrew Bashago. He is a lawyer, writer, public speaker, media personality, and a former presidential candidate best known for serving as a U.S. chrononaut and Project Pegasus during the advent of time travel and in Project Mars during the advent of interdimensional travel. Well, Andrew, how are you doing, my friend? Are you been staying out of trouble? Yes, I am, Gary. I'm doing doing great. Well, okay, that's great. You know, they also are talking on uh, another drug for, you know, kidney, uh, to rejuvenate kidneys. They're, they're experimenting. I don't know if you heard about that. Well, there's a lot being worked on. Uh, they've even experimented with uh, pig kidneys. Yeah, that's and also... the fellow who got one is doing pretty well. Yeah, that was in the news, too. So, you know, they... Yeah. They, yeah, so maybe people, you know, down the road won't have to be hooked up to the machines. Yeah, Ray Kurzweil is predicting that a lot of these medical cures will be fully operational along the lines of his book, The Singularity, um, in about five years. 2029 seems to be a, the beginning of sort of a golden age of bionic solutions. Do you think we're going to be here five years from now with the talk of nuclear exchanges with Russia? I do. I, I don't think we're going to have a nuclear war, and I would have been briefed. And I can tell all your nice listeners that I was never briefed on either a civil war or a world war affecting our country. Um, I think there may be a sort of an asymmetrical war going on. In fact, I think it already is, um, you know, sort of with the usual suspects. But I don't believe it's going to foment into a nuclear disaster because the leadership of all the major powers are smart enough not to go there. And I don't, I don't think they are. And I would have been briefed because uh, DARPA would have known about that long before it happened. Yeah. And, you know, again, how about you with all your time traveling going, I mean, and back in time, is it possible to go forward in time? Absolutely. In fact, I was in the first group of human beings to go forward with chronovision on what was that was November 5th of 1971. Um, so we were experimenting with, you know, breaking the envelope of the future. And, and we did. Now, didn't the Vatican uh, do that, too, also at one point? Well, the Vatican sponsored the work of Renetti and Gemelli, and that was just sort of a TV screen-like chronovisor. The chronovisors I was exposed to, not in 1952, when they developed that with Enrico Fermi, uh, because they, they, of course, were Vatican musicologists studying Gregorian chants, but when I was taking the program regarding chronovision in 1970, the chronovisor was producing sort of a 20-foot cube of holographic light by putting an EM signal uh, through an eight-sided bismuth crystal. And if we were in that hologram when it was propagated, we actually immediately went to that location that it was tuning in, whether it was the past or the future. How did they bring you back, either, you know, from the future or from the past? 
Well, that one was done because of the limitations of teleportation, where you had to have a, a teleportation unit in the past to get back from the past. But the chronovisors would just collapse, and we would see the other kids in the program as kind of black body emanations, and then we were all back in the present in Morristown, New Jersey. Interesting. Did they ever lose any kids at all uh, going, you know, back and forward in time? Yeah. In fact, one of my colleagues was lost, and we know she was, because when we were accidentally teleported um, from Curtis Wright in Wood Ridge, New Jersey, to Santa Fe, New Mexico, one time we got there in 1991, even though we we're supposed to be arriving in the present in 1971. And DARPA went through a lot to try to get us home, but one of the girls in the program did, did not return. And I also was told by some of the people in the program that we did lose kids in the program. But that doesn't mean they were killed, it means they were, they were transplanted somewhere else. Wow. Uh, perhaps, you know, per, perhaps, for example, staying in the past. I mean, we had to, we had to memorize the street plan of Santa Fe and also a script of what we would say to a Catholic cleric of some kind, a sheriff, uh, a leading businessman, or whoever we could find to tell them that our parents had been killed on the way to uh, the New Mexico Territory. In the event that, for example, we went in 1971 thinking we're going to arrive in 1971, but it was 1791 in in uh, New Mexico. Interesting. Uh, now, when you're being transported, what does it feel like? Well, I mean, what does your body feel like? What does your brain uh, digest? Well, it really depends on the type of time travel. Um, probably one that was clearly most nauseating was the aeronautical repositioning chamber or ARC that we were using um, to get to Mars. That was really the end of the program, you know, at the end of Project Pegasus, I've, I've sort of concluded. And um, that's where a standard, what looked like a standard elevator, would morph from a box into a cylinder and then back into a box. And initially it was 20 minutes to get to Mars, but then as Mars was growing closer to Earth and its irregular orbit around the sun, roughly two-year orbit around the sun, um, we would sometimes get to Mars as quickly as eight minutes. But that was always pretty nauseating. And so if we had as many as, as, as four astronauts in the arc, you know, again, the size of a standard elevator, it was a rare trip to Mars where somebody didn't toss their cookies. Oh, wow. How about nightmares afterwards? Did uh, being a young kid, being transported forward and backward in time, or even going to Mars, did you ever have nightmares from it? Not really. Um, they were expert at training us and bring us along in a series of sort of phased encounters. So it really didn't cause any nightmares or psychological problems as a result. It was actually something that was so fun that when they told the kids in the program that we weren't going to be teleporting uh, from New Jersey to New Mexico and back, the kids started crying because by then they were yelling, uh, Geronimo, <laughs> when they were yump, jumping through the uh, the Tesla teleporter. So it was something we actually grew fond of because it was it was fun. Well, you know, it was, I mean... it was almost like a form of play. You know, like Star Trek, where they were beaming people down to the planet and then occasionally something would happen where, you know, that uh, the signal got, you know, lost. I mean, could that happen when people are being transported where they end up just, I mean, are they taking your body and disassembling it and then reassembling it when you get there? How does it work? They were manip manipulating the area around us. So unlike Star Trek, we weren't being disintegrated. And in fact, that would <clears throat> end the life of a human being or any living creature by arresting cellular metabolism so that we were not subjected to that. That's another one of those science fiction myths. No, you just wrecked it for me. 
You know that, Andrew, because I you remember the movie The Fly? Not the yeah. one, not the original one, but the, the remake. And and right. and the fly got into the capsule. And you know, I always thought about that about Star Trek. Me and Jay Z would make fun about it. Is one thing when they did that, you know, on Star Trek where they teleported the people down. What happens if a mosquito was on them when they were being transported up? Would they have turned well, the mosquito, into mosquito? The mosquito would be brought along in the hologram, but like us, would not have been disintegrated. It just would have gone somewhere. No, but if you were disassembled and then reassembled back, that DNA from that mosquito or fly or, or you know, whatever could be in your system, and all of a sudden you're not you anymore. Well, that's not what was happening. See, they were manipulating the area around us rather than us. Like a bubble. So we weren't being disintegrated. Like a bubble? Um, yeah, a, a hologrammatic vortal tunnel is what it's called technically. But the only, the only similarity to Star Trek that we've had is being on The Unexplained with the great William Shatner as he now uh, reaches uh, age 93. So I, I, I didn't believe when I was five and Star Trek was debuting on American television when Bill Shatner was, what, 35? Yeah, he was in his that early he would 30s. be 92 and I would be 62 and we'd be working together. But that that is a link to Star Trek. But fortunately, it did not involve the kind of disintegration they were experiencing on Star Trek. Now, you know, with the technology they had to transport people back or forward in time, can they regress people's ages? Can you go back in time and be younger? Is it possible? Well, I was I was brought to an older age, a age progression, um, because before I went to from 1972 to 2045, I had to be age regressed from roughly age 10 to about age 45, with all the biological changes of that, and I had to spend three and a half weeks at Sandia in a medical lab with a high ceiling so that nobody could see in and, uh, you know, see me at such an old age because I was only 10. Uh, so I did experience age progression, but I, I didn't experience age regression like people have claimed, the so-called 20 years and back <clears throat> of people in the so-called secret space program. I, I, okay, um, I, you mentioned that. Okay, I, that is something I don't understand. I've interviewed some of these people who pl claimed that they were, you know, fighting Nazis in space and doing all this stuff, right? And they, they were yeah. actually tortured. They were taken as a young kid. They were raped. They were shot. They were dumped into some solution that brought them back to life. Then they were, you know, put on a, a spaceship as a navigator or whatever they were. And they did that for a period of time. And then they came back. But then when they came back, they were either married and had kids. I, I, I don't understand how that could all exist. Can, do you have any idea? Well, that was part of the effort at one upsmanship of those who were lying and architecting the literature of the secret space program after I brought forward four of my fellow astronauts who actually went to Mars, Americans were always sent to one place. So one of the hallmarks of those who've been making up stories is saying they went to, you know, the moon, Mars, Siri, or whatever. But it's my position, and I think it'll stand the test of time, that the government was very concerned that at least five people who had been to Mars were speaking out. That was myself, William Brett Stillings, Bernard Mendez, William White Crow, whose original name before he became a shaman was William Paris, and uh, Dr. Ralph Kennedy Johnston Sr., who was part of every major NASA program, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, Space Shuttle, and Project Mars. So I think everybody has to look a little bit carefully at the claims of the secret space program. One of the hallmarks is a kind of a one-upmanship to say, oh, well, if Andy lost his arm when he was on Mars and they don't know how it was, it was put back on, then there's this thing called the Medved that put all my cells together. So there's been a lot of 
untrue claims that have followed the true claims that were so controversial for that group of actual experiencers to impart but, uh, to the it, public. But here's the part. You know, there's one person I had on. It claimed she was out there for 20 years as a navigator, you know, in the secret space force on this battleship, you know, out there. But then she, you know, then was returned back and regressed into another body or her body. And, you know, she was married and had a son who was like 25, 30 years old. I, it, it, in my mind, how could that all have happened? I don't think it well, could Well, making a claim along the lines of a 20 year and back became a necessity for those making up stories because they were engaging in one-upsmanship. But that doesn't mean that those of us who actually went to Mars were either making up their stories or were not sharing extremely interesting accounts of what actually happened. But the claim of, of, of a 20 years and back would even reach those claiming like three 20 years and back. Well, I run into a lot of these people and they don't look 60 plus whatever their, their biological age is. So I would look uh, askance at the, the evolving literature of the so-called SSP or secret space program, because a lot of it has been folklore and not science, but there was an unprecedented um, revelation of Bishago Stellings, Mendes, White, Kern, Johnston, Perhaps Michael C. Ralph and Arthur Neumann, a sixth and a seventh uh, astronaut, were also telling the truth. And I'm happy to sort of initiated that that unprecedented revelation by truth tellers. I think we need more truth. And I think we'll probably see more of it with a second Trump administration. Because well, I think that people are missing that, that, that Trump, Trump made some statements of truths that the so-called deep state did not want him to discuss publicly. One of them was the age-old existence of what he called a, a domestic assassination program in the United States. I can confirm that that has existed to take to, to, to protect our children from the worst of the worst. But that's what Mr. Trump was discussing when he really started to make the intelligence community and even the military really start to worry about helping him get elected. Now that's scary when you think about it too. I mean, but again, I mean, can we alter by going back in time? Can you actually alter the future? No. When you go back in time, you can only, um, you, you can only, um, you, you can't alter the future because when you're in the past, you're in the actual past. And one of the myths of science fiction that has, has confused everybody is, okay, Andy went back to Gettysburg. He was the day there, he was there on November 19th of 1863, the day Lincoln gave his Gettysburg address. I wasn't there in some second retelling of November 19th, 1863. I was there the very day that Lincoln was there. Okay, so the sine qua non of time travel is going to the actual past or the actual future. So that means you can't change the past or future, you can only fulfill it. Does that make any sense? It, it does. But there's, yeah, yeah. there's you, you no... You can't change... Yeah, you, you're, you're going to the original iteration of that day, that time. And that's what we were always doing, whether but, we're going to the past or the future. But so if I was transported back in time, and with the thought in my mind, I'm going to assassinate Mussolini or Hitler. And I tried. Would it, would, would it stop me from uh, assassinating them if I had the opportunity? And what would have happened if I was able to assassinate one of those two? Well, you, you would have been able to assassinate those two. But we know you didn't because we know what history contains. Um, I call that the kill Hitler paradox. Now, if, if you tried to kill Hitler before his terrible rise to power as the Fuhrer, when he was still an obscure Vietnamese postcard painter, you wouldn't know to kill Hitler. You wouldn't have a motive to kill Hitler. Now, if you tried to kill him after his rise to power, we know you wouldn't be able to, because you didn't. 
because you would have been going to the actual past or the actual future to do so. And it would have contained what the past and future contain. You could have fulfilled his, his murder if he was murdered or if he was really killed rather than he escaped to, you know, Argentina and that whole story. Um, you, you, you could have killed him when he died and history knows that he died, but you couldn't have preempted history by time traveling to kill him earlier than he was killed. If in fact he was killed, well, I don't think he was, he went, he went from, uh, he went from Germany to Spain and from Spain to Argentina via U-boat. And then he spent the last 10 years of his life, like 1952 to 62 in Paraguay under the regime of the Paraguayan uh, dictator Adolf Stressner. So Hitler did not die. He was brought to South America by the Vatican rat lines. So you could have killed him sometime before 1962 when he actually died, but we know you didn't. Well, can because I ask you? He died can, in 1962. Well, Andrew, can could you have kidnapped somebody and brought him back uh, to the future? Well, there there were a couple times when one of the people in the past accidentally came back with us, but that was always part of the past. Those stories had had been told. And we were even sourcing material when that happened. So in other words, if we came back via, via a, a Tesla teleporter or chronovision, if we accidentally grabbed somebody from, from the past and brought them back, our historians would then find references to those bizarre experiences in something they wrote, like a diary or a, a, a short story or something. So the bottom line is we can't change the past by by visiting it or the future. We can only fulfill it well, because we're in the actual the actual past or future. There's no there's no change of causality if you're going to the original event in the past and future. Now, Andrew, could the is the past still existing as the past and the future existing as the future, or do we have to make the future? Is the, that, that's the, the question, you know, I'm sure some of the listeners might want to know. Well, the time-space continuum and the ability to reach different versions of the past, for example, proves the multiverse and it proves the time-space continuum. The answer is yes. I mean, I'm going to do something next Tuesday, right? I don't necessarily know everything that it involves, right? But that past already exists. It just has to be reached by me. So the past, present, and future exist. What changes is our perspective. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. So I mean, when do you think the future? Well, when, as if the government has been doing this for all these years, do you think it's going to be a future coming up that? You know, we can go into a building and say, I want to go back and look at dinosaurs. I want to go back to the Roman Empire. I want to see Pompeii the day before the, the volcano erupted. Right, right. You think there'll be... I, I've i called for that, and I've predicted that, sort of like virtual museums and libraries where people couldn't hear about, you know, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address or Washington laying the cornerstone of the Capitol on September 18th of 1793 or what have you, but that's going to require presidential leadership. And that's why I ran in 2016. Only when we get a U.S. president who says, we're, we're going to stop lying about this and we're going to give today's school children the opportunity to visit the dinosaurs and, and we'll send them to the era when they were only, you know, vegetarians or, you know, uh, herbivores, so they're not eaten by those dinosaurs, and so that's what they do with us. But I've always believed that today's kids should have the same opportunity that the kids on Pegasus had to know about reality by time traveling to the past and future. Now we won't be able to send mass people, uh, you know, on on mass timelines because that'll lead to mass chaos. Imagine how everybody would buy Microsoft on its initial day of public offering 
if they knew about the fortune of Bill Gates and the success of Microsoft. So there's things we're going to have to not give access to. But in a, in a general sense, if you're, start, if you're talking about visiting really auspicious historical events, we should be able to do that with, with really no problem because people know what happened during those events anyway. So how, we don't want to really reveal every big stock from in the future. That's what I was going to ask you. If I could go in the future, you know, then you would know what the economy is going to be like, what stock to buy and what not to, and come back and become a billionaire. Right, right. And see, if we did that, all the money in the economy would flow to just a few opportunities, you know, Apple, Microsoft, and so forth. And that would collapse the economy because the economy depends on a diversity of goods and services being created and purveyed at different prices. So we can't do that. We can't let mass people on mass timelines, including economically advantageous ones, or we would collapse the economy. That would be an untoward effect of standardizing time travel. But we can certainly show school kids things from the past um, that that we know about. But the, 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 the neat thing about it is they would see what it really looked like, not just be told about it or see a drawing. Well, I, I, you know, you keep talking about kids. How about us older people, you know, that are about ready to go in a nursing home and want to go back? <laughs> well, older people can be kids, too, you know. Yeah, well, it's, you know. They're still young at heart. I want to play kick can, you know, again or something. I mean, I'm I'm 62 going on on eight. So, but uh, so yeah, if, if if older people are interested, they could go to those same virtual museums and libraries that I've been calling for for 20 years. There's no reason not to show people such sites. We just can't show them valuable information that will cause untoward effects, like economic opportunities because then we would just collapse the economy and you they were aware of that you remember the movies a soyant green what is it called the soyant green you remember that movie oh yeah sorry in fact i met uh, stanley r greenberg who uh who wrote it at uc san diego in 1979 my freshman year of school because his daughter was one of my classmates so i, I met greenberg and he was a heck of a nice guy well, you remember the you know, actor, the writer of Edward uh, G. Robinson? It, 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 and at one point, you know, what they were doing was people, when they got a certain age, they would take him into the special room and they would have all these, you know, movies of what Earth was like, you know, when it was beautiful or rivers and, and you know, deer were running and all that. And then they kind of like put you to sleep permanently. I mean, could could they someday maybe be able, like, okay, well, your time is near, or this is the man of date time. You, you're only allowed to live to 85, for example. Could they then say, hey, we can put you back anywhere in time and, well, and transport you know, you, you somebody? Subject of, you you brought the subject of age regression. I've heard rumors that. Okay, you're breaking up. Oh, let me make it this. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Um, I've heard rumors that age regression is being used and that it was um, it was developed by TRW and then they sold it to, oh God, Grumman, I think. And it's been, um, for example, I had a, a contact in the CIA when I came forward named Virginia Old who said she was about, 76 or 86 and she said Andy I'm I'm so happy I'm getting my 16 year old body and then I saw her on the Vancouver Washington waterfront and it was like a 16 year old Virginia old so it was either a lookalike or it was somebody who was her a couple weeks later after getting her the younger version of her body so I think age regression is being used that would be my you know conclusion very uh, interesting based on what was already that operational 50 years earlier Very when I was age progress before going forward in time. Okay. Andrew, JC, did we have a color or do we have a color? We do. Tom's on the line. Look, Tom, how are you doing tonight, Tom? I'm doing well, sir. Okay. My, my question for your guest 
is did he ever do any research or go back in time or remote view or actually uh, view the crucifixion of Jesus? Yes, I viewed I viewed the crucifixion. It was about a 20 to 30 black and white film at the Sandia National Lab in 1972. Now, when Maria Constancia Chavez, Connie Chavez, also known as Pili uh, Chavez, that was her nickname in Albuquerque, she was an old friend of my dad's, and she couldn't watch The Crucifixion of Jesus. The best way I can describe it is the, the Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson didn't do it justice. It was hideous. I felt like there was there were locusts or wasps hovering in the center of the room. It was so evil. And she was hiding from looking at it, you know, holding her hands above her eyes to prevent her from seeing it. So it was so awful. And after we left the, the viewing hall there at Sandia, my father said to Connie, Connie, I don't know why you're why you're acting like that. And being a very devout Christian, she said, how should I act, Ray? They were crucifying my Lord. And my dad said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But we also have footage that, um, you know, three days later, two angels appear, Jesus stands up, and the, and the two men help him remove the, the, uh, the rock from his crypt. So this is an aspect of the time travel cover-up in a country that was founded as a Christian nation. That was proven by my mentor at UCLA, Norman Cousins, in his book, In God We Trust, that all of the founders, except for Franklin, were evangelical Christians. So even though we had a polytheistic country that would neither establish or prevent the exercise of people's innate religion, we didn't stay on that path because we we hid the proof of Jesus' resurrection. Now, I didn't see that. I'm making a reference to what my dad said his team captured. But I did see the, the scenes of both his ministry and his crucifixion that I know they captured. I, I witnessed that for like a half hour. So I think my dad was being entirely truthful about the fact that they had also captured scenes of Jesus of Nazareth resurrecting. I think that sh that's one of the things that should be shown to American people and the people of the world. Okay, it's, you're, it's, bra you're breaking it's, up it's again. A tr okay. It's a, uh, it's the truth. It's what happened. Why, why make films about, you know, bears eating salmon, but not the, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth? It just doesn't doesn't work for me. I, th I think they made a mistake. I, I think so. Hey, Andrew, our time is up. I want to th thank you for taking, you know, Friday night, you know, uh, in because of the time difference to come back on again. And maybe a couple of weeks from now, we can get you back on again. And again, I want, you know, I want the best for you and I want you to have a great weekend. Will you? Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, I enjoyed it once again. and I'd love to come back. Okay, my friend, you take care. Okay. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Uh-huh. Well, JC, think about this one. If you could go back in time, would you? Seriously. Yes, I would. I would love to go back to the Victorian area, uh, the Old West, about 1870s, and then maybe uh, in the UK, Old Victorian London. That would be great. Yeah. You know, just think about it. If we could go back in time, there's things like, well, there's people I like to apologize to how I treated them in high school. But could you imagine, like, even the one Twilight Zone episode where the guy somehow went back in time? He was, like, in his mid-30s, uh, executive, you know, in sales. And he went back to his parents' house and knocked on the door. And his dad came out. And he said, hey, dad. I'm your son. Could you imagine what that would have been like for if somebody knocked on your door and, and you're, they're 35, you're, you know, and you're only like, like in your 35 and they're saying you're a son. I, I mean, could you imagine? Yeah. I seen a couple of shows or the same scenario only 
their father was like 12. You know, they went back even further back and it's, that would be a shock to your system. I think for both parties involved, Gary, but what would happen if you went back in time and you got hit by a car? Now, now it's going to be, well, okay, well, that was meant to happen. But yeah. if, it, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm still confused on this situation, on this topic. Well, it's like the old scenario where the guy invents a time machine by the instructions he found in 1950 that was written in year 2000 but was sent back and lost in the year 50. So it's like a, there's no beginning or ending. It's all connected. Do you know how many people probably have invented or tried to invent time machines like Madman, oh. Max? I mean, you think about this. You know, here you, you step into it. And how do you know? That, okay, well, you, maybe you did go back in time or maybe you were vaporized. And according to Mad Mike... Yeah, there, Mad Man Mike, yes. Yeah, there's still a, a bolt out in the multiverse, or did it come back? I don't know. The last yeah. I heard of him uh, was back about seven years ago. He was going to come on my show like an idiot. I lost his phone number, and that's when he was moved to somewhere. And now the last I heard, he was in Hawaii. I've not been able to trace him down, but I would like to talk to him, you know, because it was rather interesting when Art had him back on, on Midnight on the Desert, after a long period of not having him on, and, you know, talking about it. Yeah, that'd be great to get uh, Mad Mike. As a matter of fact, Art's the one that coined the phrase Mad Mike because he was afraid he was going to fry himself, I believe. But I did, you know, be an electronic background, let's face it, you steal a whole bunch of Transformers from the power lines, right? Mm. So you're stepping the voltage up with a lot of current behind it on top of it. Yeah, Madman Malcolm. You are not Mike. Malcolm. Uh, somebody just corrected me in December. Thank you. But uh, you think about it, okay? If, if you hit create all this high voltage with a lot of current. See, I could zap you with 220 volts or 1,000 volts right now. But if it doesn't have any amperage behind it, you're going to go, ow. Okay? <laughs> it's not going to kill you. When you start putting amperage on the voltage, right? Now you touch it, you look like, you know, here's the thing. Years ago, we used to have fun. We would go out in this one radio station in Forks, Washington. And we would roast hot dogs and marshmallows. We didn't have a barbecuer. You know how we did it? With uh, the electrical stuff, that comes, what do you call it? The, um... Okay, uh, the antenna. Yeah. Okay. All you had to do is put it on a long stick and make sure that the, the other part of the stick you're holding on to has a lot of electrical tape on it. <laughs> and you hold it about like six inches to a foot away from the tower. And like your hot dog is done before you can count to three. <laughs> and if you put your marshmallow there and count more than one, it's already cremated. It's kind of like a open air uh, microwave, so to speak. But did it ever taste electrical? I mean, you had to eat it, of course. No, oh, we, we were just doing it for fun. Oh, sure. Okay, but you know, but cause the reason why is yeah. one time I had to climb up that tower when I was young and not fat. I had wow. to climb up this tower, you know, which was like 150 feet. What? It, 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 and to replace the light bulb on the top of it. Okay. And because I was the one that had the first class license, hey, you know, okay. So here's the point. When you're coming down, you yell, somebody's standing at the door, because this, in this case, the antenna was right next to the station. I mean, like, like 25, 30 feet away. You would yell for them to shut the transmitter off for a second. Mm -hmm. And then you would jump off and you make sure when you jump off, you let go of it at the same time. If you don't, you look like that hot dog I talked about. That's that sounds like you're putting a lot of trust in somebody with your life. You, you do, but the station can't just shut down. I mean, they can shut down for a matter of like three, four seconds, and then you know you just hope you don't fall back the wrong way. But what I'm saying is, what Mad Man Malcolm did is yeah. he took these transformers, right? And he added coils on it, which then increased the, the amperage and the voltage. 
I just, in my logical mind, if you, he talked how he would put like a nail in it and it would disappear. Right. But did it go forward in time or backwards? You have no way to regulate it. Or did it just vaporize from all the voltage he was cranking out and amperage? That's that's kind of what I think happened because, that, like you said, when you and he wound them pretty tight, them coils and and a lot of amps, like you say, behind it. Maybe it just fried it. It it vaporized it. Yeah, you know, that's like, why. And a part of me doesn't believe he did go back in time. I I really don't. How do you regulate? You step in it. How do you know where you're gonna go? The what? Yep. For, I listened to that. You know the original interview. I listened to his last interview with. Uh, Art, me and Art talked about it. And even Art said, you know, hey, this don't make, because Art was the, you know, electronic freak, you know, with radio equipment uh, since he was a kid. And we were talking about this doesn't make uh, any logical sense by taking the high voltage transformers and trying to go back in time with that, that way. It, it, just, it, 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 it would just vaporize you. Yeah, I think it's between getting vaporized and I think it's a real good chance of getting totally electrocuted. Well, uh, you wouldn't have enough time to say, oh, shit. No. You're going to go, uh, and then you're gone. You're, you're like yeah. cremated as you your ashes fall on the ground. You know, the, the amount of transformers he supposedly had, okay, which has been documented by the, the police department, the detective at that time, documented, verified, he did, ha he did steal all those. But well, I, I just don't think that's the one way to go in time travel. The other I, way is you go out and get a 57 Etzel, right? And you put Vicks Vapor Rub on it, and you go 180 miles an hour and, and go back in time that way. What? It's about the same way as if you took the Transformers. Yeah, or get a DeLorean and go 88 miles an hour, but... Uh, yeah, listen, supposedly the way just they caught him, Gary, was he, he blacked out the town he was in. Yeah, well, it would. Could you imagine what it would pop transformers right down the, down the road and then cause the circuit to break on the, 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 uh, the, the power station. Think yeah. about that. I mean, seriously, have you ever been driving down the road and you've seen a transformer pop? Have oh, you yeah. ever seen one pop? I have, and let me tell you something. It's very shocking. I've been riding a bicycle, one pop not right right above me, and I just about lost it. Yeah. So again, you take four, five, six of them, and put them in series, and the voltage on it is so max with the current. And hmm. you know, again, Gibbs. Okay, I actually have it. I'm going to show people next week on camera. I actually dug in the closet. And I found I found my little transporter. I want to, you send that to me. Yeah, okay, all, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? It, it's a coil in it, yeah. and, it's, and it's some resistors in it, and there's not much more to it. What people have claimed, now see, originally he claimed that would, you could go back in time. The last time he was on Art Show, he was telling people, well, it makes you mentally go back in time, but you physically don't go back. Originally, it was physically you go back. And people would say, well, you know, he would say it was because what it did, it had a coil in this thing you ha hold on to. Okay? And it's just creating a vibration. That's all it is. Right. And, and probably know, a magnetic field. If you had an old TV from the 60s, 70s, you could degauss your picture tube with it. You know, yeah, not only that, but I would think with all the PVCs and those transformers and all that electricity and current, you, you would, I think, amp up your chance of getting cancer or something else, too. Oh, by the way, do you know last week we almost lost the whole grid in the United States? No, I didn't. From a solar that. flare. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And again, uh, the government seems to want to spend money in other areas and not sure up our grid. And that is the scary part. You know, if our grid goes, you know, if that solar flare would have been a little bit hotter because it was a direct hit and it was one of the highest recorded since we've been recording them. It would, could you imagine there would be no internet? 
It would be if in in that would be the the best case. No internet. The other is you go turn on your TV. Is no TV there because you don't have the internet. But your TV doesn't come on, and you flip the light switch, and that doesn't come on. Yeah, you then you flush the toilet, and you realize it's not filling back up. Nothing. You pretty much just transported back to about the 1870s. Yeah, <laughs> and that's scary too because no food is going to go from the warehouse to the stores. It's, it, you know, because the vehicles, unless you have a 57 Etzo or 57 Chevy or something like that, they're not going to start. And that's only as good as far as the gas will get you that's in the tank. And a lot of people think, well, gee, I'll just unplug everything. It that's doesn't matter. Do you realize also it's come out from the Pentagon last week? All it would take is three nukes. Three nukes in the uh, 200 miles up above the, our planet. Over the United States, one on the East Coast, one above uh, the Midwest, and one on the West Coast. And our grid system would be totally fried. Everything you own, it doesn't matter if it's plugged in or not plugged in, is history. Never will work again, even if they manage to get the power back up. Right. And then, you know what happens when you, you don't have any transportation or any way to communicate or any food or water? Uh, people will go out of their mind. Or they'll tribe up. Yeah. Well, I got a solution to that. Save your Campbell soup cans and, and start collecting balls of spur, uh, string and you can talk to your neighbor next door. <laughs> yeah, that's about it, huh? Uh, but yeah, and and the thing is, like you mentioned, these things are not these transformers. They're not made in our country. They're made in countries that has a little bit lax on the inspections and how they're made and safety. Well, most of them are made in India because the oils they use for the the cool the transformers uh, are very toxic. It'll give you cancer. So yeah. you know, evidently, they don't care about their population working in those factories. But here's the problem. Uh, your power company says, okay, I need a new uh, uh, four dozen new transformers, right? Because they have a certain supply of them. But if the, all of them went out, they don't have enough to get it on. How about the substation? They, You know, you're talking about uh, build one of those. You put the order in, it'd be a year or two. And then they have to ship it from India to yep. here. And I don't imagine any of the ships are going to go, you know, unless they're military ones, which are shielded, by the way. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting because it, it, it could be years to get the grid back up. Let me tell you, Gary, I did a little experiment a couple of years ago. I thought, let me drive around my block just to see how many transformers. Yeah. I, I counted 25 transformers just in a round block area. 25. And, and a little town of 20,000 in one block area. Now, you imagine how many transformers are across the whole country, Gary. Just think about that for a minute. That's a lot of transformers. And, and I got to tell you something else. There was a storm here, I don't know, 10 years or so ago that wiped out a bunch of transformers in one little town. It took 10 days for them to get all those transformers fixed in that little town. And they had to call help in from Canada to help them. Well, see, that's it. There's not going to be enough transport. All it would take, I mean, seriously, is people need to write their congressmen and senators and say, why aren't we doing this? For a billion dollars, we can sure our grid up. But, you know, a billion dollars where it goes right now. I mean, you know, it's crazy. It is. And yeah, I'll it tell you what, you know, our oil reserves our national oil reserves are almost depleted. There's only 15 days of oil to, you know, make gas and diesel. Only 15 days supply because we drained it all, right? To supposedly keep the gas prices down, which never happened. It didn't lower the price. Now, uh, our supreme leader is refusing. He said back a month ago, well, we're going to replenish them. But the oil prices are so high now, he just announced the other day, we're not going to replenish it. Could you imagine 15 days supply is all we have? Yeah, that's something to think about. And I also, on top of that, gas prices, at least here, Gary, is the highest they've been, if not ever. And that least, is. 
that's been in too. You know, Washington State is the highest in the whole country right now per gallon. That's crazy. But again, we, we don't think about the future. That's the scary part, that we're not prepared for anything. And that's why we need to get a prepper on the show, and we need to talk about what people need to do if something did bad happen. Because the first thing is the people who live in the cities are going to be the first ones that are going to really suffer the most. Yeah, and I always think back, too, to the the one guest you had on the set or somebody called in and told you, well, I just I got transformers or, I mean, you know, generators. I'll be fine. And, and like we've said, that's like raising a big red flag to all the predators out there saying, like a dinner bell, come get my food. Well, you know, again, just think about this. If another country, you know, wanted not to destroy our our our, our our structures, our civilization. Infrastructure. Yeah. The easiest way to do it is just take out the grid. Yep. No, they don't have to fire nuclear detonations and all across the country and kill everybody right off the bat. The best thing they could do is, I hate to say it, fire off three, three nukes, like I just mentioned. And then guess what? Whatever country they do that to, they're basically back in the Stone Age. Yes, the best way to cripple a country in a war is cut off their communication and their transportation and their resources. If you can do that, that's a three for three. You've got them wrapped up. They can't do nothing. Yeah, how many people have enough water? An average person doesn't realize they, they burn through five to eight gallons of water a day. Now, mm -hmm. somebody's probably saying, that's not true. I only drink two glasses or three glasses of water a day. Think about it. You're going to have to go poo-poo. You're going to flush the toilet. There's a gallon, gallon and a half right there, right? And, you know, unless you want to just let it build up for a week or two, but then you'll have to sleep outside. Uh, but you think about it. The average person, if something happened, you're going to have a have lot of water, and most people don't. They right. don't. I mean, some people I know I talk to, oh, yeah, I got a 24 case of water. And I go, good. You, you got about four days worth of water if you don't flush the toilet and don't do anything. Right. And the other kind of double indemnity here is if they do set them nukes off up in the air, like you mentioned, 200 miles above, that's going to fall down. I would think some of it come down to the surface. So you really can't. No, you'll get radiation, but actually the radiation won't hit the earth. Oh, uh, yeah. And again, you're not going to have fireballs hitting the earth from 200 miles up. The satellites, every bit of satellites will be gone. Oh, yeah. The space station will be gone. Uh, all that will be gone. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that that's just what you have to look at. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but we need to get reality here. And like I said, we need to sure up the grid. Last week, we came that close from losing our grid. And you know what? They talk about everything else in the news, but they don't really come out and t tell you, hey, people. You ain't going to be able to watch any reruns of Andy Griffith's show this week because there ain't going to be no TV. <laughs> and then the, some of the freaking idiot. Well, I got a Faraday cage. And yeah. I got myself, my cell phone in it. I got a radio in it. And I got all, and you know, I look at them and I, and I say, well, what good is that going to do? Right. Yeah. Unless everybody else has got one, you're not going to be talking to nobody or listening to nothing because it's going to fry everybody else's. Well, the cell phone ain't going to be any good because there ain't going to be any cell towers working, is it? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, again, I want to thank uh, Thomas Jane for coming on the show. It was refreshing to have him on. And I respect him not to want to go into his encounter, which might be quite serious. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, I really like the deep blue sea and all that. And then Andrew was kind of interesting here tonight, but again, uh, who do, who's our guest next week? Oh, Hey, next Wednesday, we've got Paul Wallace coming on talking about the ancient, uh, mankind. They warned about, uh, invasion from aliens way back then. And is it doomed to repeat itself? And then. Next Thursday, coming up, we got Josh Smith coming on. He does not think that Bigfoot is our friend, let me tell you. And then to wrap up the week, we've got Loretta Swit. Remember MASH? Loretta Swit, Gary? Swift. Swift. Swit. Swit, whatever. Swit, heat, hill, so the letter. Now I came and say, you know, hot lips. How's that? 
There you go. And, and then who's our second guest? Second guest is going to be Chris George, Christopher George, the retired 30 year park ranger of, I think he was served in about four parks across the country. Yeah, he actually ran two parks before he retired. And he was a federal law enforcement ranger, by the way. And we're going to be talking about, well, the scary things that rangers saw, seen, and people disappearing. We're going to be talking about that. And then the week after, who do we have on? Hey, yeah, the week after we have Ron Janix coming on. He is the he's the one that runs and manages Contact in the Desert. He's the top guy. He's going to be on. And then after that, we've got Bob Berman coming on. Skyman Bob going to talk about stuff in you know space and weather and all kind of fun stuff like that. And then Friday wraps around two weeks down the road is Jeffrey Mark. He is going to talk about Lucille Ball and all the things she's done. He's like an encyclopedia about Lucille Ball. Oh, I remember her back, you know, her heyday before getting into movies was on radio. A lot of people don't realize that. So hey, we've got some good shows lined up again. Go to our website. It'll be updated again tomorrow. You can see all the guests we got coming up, uh, their bios, and you can find out about them. Again, we have the, the fantastic Guy Ticker has done fantastic with the news. And if you can't find it there, you're not going to find it anywhere. So you might want to make that your one stop for looking for news. Just go to www.nightdreamstalkradio.com and hit that little, you know, tab. It says, well, the news and everybody, I want to thank everybody that was on chat. I really enjoy you guys, you know, the loyalty and all that. And until we catch you. Well, don't forget, by the way, tomorrow, the hitman, yes, the hitman, don't tell anybody, Steve Bassett talking about UFO disclosure at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific at 9 p.m. Eastern time right here on Night Dream Stock Radio Network. Everybody have a good one. We'll catch you on the other side of the campground. Everybody take care. Exciting news! I'm Guy Ticker, NDTR's news director, anchor, ace reporter, and coffee maker. And yes, I am excited. Coming soon to Night Dreams Talk Radio, our online store. It'll be your one-stop destination for all things paranormal and unexplained. Explore a curated collection of t-shirts, mouse pads, accessories, and merchandise inspired by the mysteries of the unknown. From Bigfoot to UFOs <laughs> and everything in between. And we mean everything. Stay tuned for updates and get ready to dive into the supernatural world like never before. Get ready to embrace the intrigue and explore the extraordinary at the Night Dreams Talk Radio online store at www.nightdreamstalkradio.com. Incidentally, that website is also the one to go to for the latest news from UAPs to Bigfoot and much more from me. Guy Ticker. Go to the website now and happy shopping. www.nightdreamstalkradio.com. Who's friends with all the night dreamers talking to you at night? Gary on the radio, but maybe he's not in sight. Bigfoot's on his tail, flying UFOs, that's right. Gary's talk show radio Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday night. If you need a friend to talk to, he will always be there. The night dream.